Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. I can't speak too loud, but I hope that my voice is clear. The lion sees what the lamb does not. Nature has projected various designs these various designs based on their ability, their instincts, and their expression find themselves in hierarchy. What's very interesting about the human species is that the human species, uh, it's one species, yet the minds of people differ and they differ in accordance to various complexities. There are some people who've been raised not to, in some sense, withhold certain urges within them. There are some people who are raised to actually let these urges free. Me personally in this life, I transitioned from an Eastern culture to a Western culture. And the first thing I noticed immediately was that the same self-impositions that I had projected upon myself uh, were only of my core. What I mean by that is that the world you live in is so vast, you cannot stay in a definition for too long. There's a very interesting quote by, uh, what's his name, Frederick Nietzsche. He says, the surest way to corrupt a youth is to instruct him to hold in higher esteem those who think alike than those who think differently. I find that we are social creatures, and that means we care about the input only the collective image, but how we appeal to the collective image. In this talk, I want to dive, per se, more into hierarchies. You see, every time I give these talks, it's like as if I'm like a drone. And this drone moves to various aspects of this landscape. So when I speak in the waking state, I am in some sense entertaining an existential landscape which has been uh, organized into hierarchies subjectively. These hierarchies are very important because in some sense you're going to notice, um, especially if your youth was bright, you're going to notice that, how can I say it? It's like there's levels of inner freedom and levels of outer freedom. If the levels of outer freedom are given, the problems, the person, you know, the mind requires problems. I don't know how to say this, kind of like consciousness and free will requires an unknown to exist. Because if it was all known, then it's as if the free will would be even free of itself. There would be nowhere to go. There would be no direction. The unknown is the greatest inspiration of everybody's life. If you notice something that exciting moments of your life are unknown. 
They are steps into the unknown. I have understood that in this life, there requires to be self-maintenance. You can't live too much for yourself, you'll miss out. You can't live too much for others, you'll miss out. Eventually, the person will wonder how to live. So that's when the unknown becomes a value. Alan Watts kind of explained this in a very interesting way. He said, imagine you could have any dream and you organize the dreams. Let's say ten, like 10,000 dreams you organize. Then later on, you realize, like after you've tried everything, every possible thing, imagine your free will had the freedom of the concept of God. Let's say you could create anything and, and, and your free will was not denied or did not have limits. You're going to see eventually you'd want a dream that you don't control. It's as if there's there's a sort of, it's it, they, the Sufi dervishes acknowledge it as a hadith, um, a saying of the prophet, prophet but in the Muslim tra tradition, this hadith is not authenticated. So the hadith is called Hadith Qudsi, and what it means is it's pretty much this passage where it's as if uh, kind of the relaying of God's intentions uh, and the intentions of God was like something like I was unknown and I wanted to be known and it's as if the intention of manifest evolution was to make the unknown known do you see anytime we you know something more about your moment you live, you, you feel as if a more, the free will is in more control, you know? There's, some, there's something interesting in sociology. It's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And it's pretty much looking at the urges uh, of the motivation of the human being, in some sense. So first, the needs of the person is physiological. You need food, water, and rest. After you have these physiological needs met, you suddenly bring into condition safety and security. Especially for the men in this world, it's like I, I love Steve Harvey, how he said there is a sort of financial clock for a man, you know, or the masculine position, a sort of provisional need and an ability to provide, you know. So it's as if after food, water, and rest, you're see, see, seeking a sort of safety and security, okay. Now, I believe this safety, it, it, the more moment you get external safety, that's when you, it, your inner psychology feels relaxed. So the safety can be seen as even a psychological safety. Okay? So at first, physiological. Okay? You, the, let's just see it in, in the external dimension, and then I'll, I'll uh, add depth to Maslow's pyramid. But okay. <laughs> so let's first see the 2D version of his pyramid, then we'll kind of speak about the 3D. So anyways, the physiological is the first need. After your physiological needs, such as food, water, and rest, you seek security, and so the next need is safety. After you have safety, imagine you're a human being right now, where it's like your food and water and rest was not a problem. You can instantly, efficiently handle that. Afterwards, you go towards safety. Now imagine you got safety. Okay, let's say you were right now like a millionaire or a billionaire or whatever. You know, you had you were sitting on your pot of gold. <laughs> and so you'd have that security. Now the next thing is, on being on top of that pot of gold, you suddenly feel lonely. So the next need, hierarchy uh, of need, is in some sense intimate relationships, friendship, social existence, a social life. Right? So this is the next need. Now beyond this need comes another need.
now you see it's as if the needs are becoming more internal as the external gets handled okay so it's like after the person has find that financial or manifest security and safety the person is seeking the meaning of it. it's as if you're after you've satisfied the physical existence you're going on to seek, satisfy the emotional intelligence okay the emotional existence of your lover and so that's where love friendship it's as if you have to uh, also learn from other minds if you only learn from yourself that can become pretty lonely too you know being a mystic is um is a sort of direction towards isolation however Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that the pers person handled the physiological need, moved on to this need of safety, handled that need, now has moved on to love, friendship, in some sense, deeper dimensions of family. You can say family is a sort of friendship too, you know? It's as if aside from the roles that people play in a family, they are they're each of each one of them are souls. You see, each one of them has their unique existence or origination of mind. And so in some sense, it's to be honest, the whole world is a friend. Manifest reality at best becomes a friend for you. <laughs> at worst, you feel rejected by this friend. Trust me, as I speak right now, there isn't people in physical poverty. There are people also in internal poverty. And that internal poverty is a feeling that the world is abandoning them, you know. And the only reason the world is abandoning them because the person suddenly sees every person has their own world to deal with. When will they have attention to be on me? <laughs> you see, so you see, that it's as if like, how can I tell you? We after the physical need, safety need, the love and being is an introduction to a cosmic drama. It is the need to be an individual among other individuals, pretty much. Okay? Now we go above that. We go above that. So after the physiological need, safety need, and the love and belonging need, we go to the need of esteem. E-S-T-E-E-M. And this is very interesting. It's that feeling of accomplishment. If you notice most of my talks, I'm directing people to this. There's a need. There's a need because you are a temporary being, so you want to hold your action and your moment and your value as an existential phenomena in high regard. Just like the Zen master said, you want to climb the mountain of heaven by already being at the top. You see, it's that feeling of accomplishment, the feeling that you did something before the lights went out, you know? So it's, a, it's becoming collective. So from the need of love and belonging, we are going into, in some sense, a sort of existential need in accordance to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, in some sense to a sort of, how can I tell you? You want to live as your species. That's the collective urge. You want to fit the need of the species. This is why we see so many billionaires and millionaires. When they get bored, they become philanthropists, pretty much. Anyways, so after the need of a sort of valuable self and a valuable civilization, we go to the ultimate need, which is self-actualization which is, as Maslow says, achieving one's full potential. Now, this is so key because eventually you see the top of the pyramid, if you were literally started on the lower floor of this pyramid, which is the physiological needs, you've kind of gotten to the top. When you've gotten to the top of the pyramid, literally you have the full view, you have the highest angle, 
So that is self-actualization. Now, self-actualization, there, there, can, there there's a lot of debates, but philosophically, there is a very profound debate on it. How does one actualize their, the full potential of their self, even if their brain has a sort of limitation of grasp, which some, what, what is it, scientists say that 12% we're using, 12% of our brain, mainly the frontal lobe, and the other aspects are, are left dormant because our environment has evolved to some more of a controlled and controlled environment. It's as if the experience of the human being is being governed by its frontal lobe and the other kingdoms of the brain, the other aspects of the brain are in some sense left in the dark. We have chosen to walk in the tunnel of the frontal lobe. And so, we reach the end, the end of need, the end of need to prove to itself that it is its ultimate being. You see? For me, ideology is a marketplace. People buy into whatever they like. I find that self-actualization becomes multidimensional. And this is a kind of playful thing. I mean, of course, I have very unique philosophies and I, I, I guess certain uncommon viewpoints on geometry. But for me, it's as if when you treat geometry of like a language, the law of duality is being seen. What that means is you see a shape and you wonder about its opposite, okay? And so it's as if you see, so you see your mind first acknowledges the normal triangle, but then becomes the inverted triangle. So it's as if you imagine underneath the pyramid, there's another pyramid opposite of it. I'm saying it's kind of like attaining a sort of diamond crystallized consciousness. The Buddhic mind kind of entertains such a notion. There's something called the Diamond Sutras. You know. There is a quote, some also call it the Lotus Sutra. There's a quote that says, in the Lotus Sutra, that says, keep your mind alive and free without keep your mind alive and free without abiding in anywhere or anything what I'm trying to say is you take a normal triangle and an inverted triangle and you imagine you can connect the right side of the normal triangle to the left side of the inverted triangle and you suddenly see they connect in that connection, there is the reflection of other universes. What I'm trying to say is Maslow's laws are incredible achievement that this man's kind of made into this pyramid. However, this pyramid is only in one parallel reality now. You're going to see the pyramid is connected to its opposite. You're going to see the purpose of self-actualization is to help suddenly come you come back to the physiological. This is why the greatest minds are trying to help people's lives. They're trying to get rid of hunger, get rid of uh, like, you know, impure water around the world. You know. And why is that? That's the full meaning of self-actualization. It's connected. It's like Maslow's hierarchies appears like a triangle a pyramid but it is in some sense a spiral you reach the top you come back to the bottom you reach the top you come back to the bottom so it's like you actualize a sense of yourself but then you see the whole world is walking and that's the immensity this is something people don't realize it's like the you're you can never be alone in this world literally if you are uh, in the range of uh, other minds, your minds are not lonely. The body is, of course, isolated from their minds. This self-actualization is pretty much enlightenment in ancient times. 
And the secret of it is that if the door is inside, it's within. It's not outside. That's like, and some people will be like, Mr. Ben, what do you mean? And I'll be like, yeah, to the common man, excuse my language, it's a mind fuck. But, <laughs> but what it is, is a sort of paradoxical balance for pure witnessing. Because you can get driven and be pulled by both. What do I mean by that? That means my moment, based on my attention's preference, can dive into the metaphysical and subjective, or it can dive into the physical and objective. When I'm handling objects, there's no thoughts around. It's rhythmic. It's like a flow, you know? So living in objective reality, it's like a roller coaster for the mind. You enjoy every single thing. Because in order for us to study the hierarchy and come to a realization of what the lion is seeing and what the lamb is seeing is the same world, yet the lion sees more of that same world than the lion. And mainly it is due to evolutionary value, but there's also uh, the value of DNA. So let me tell you something cool that's happened in history that isn't really, I think there isn't much spotlight on it. <clears throat> it's the fact that no longer in an economical society, the moment in our history we became an economical civilization, you know, in that moment, it was as if, how can I tell you, your birth was not just its value in your DNA, it was also where in the story of the world it was positioned. You see? So, we evo Darwin's evolution is the same thing as Maslow's physiological. However, we evolved to a point where we became conscious of individual danger. We, we, we lived for ourselves. Our ancestors made a decision to walk towards civilization, to step out of the cave of an unconscious animalistic loop. It's hard being an animal when the spirit of humanity is so alive. For me, it's as if it's the era of the minds. It's kind of hard to say, but dear human humanity, like our species is li literally evolving out of individualistic, objective being. Naturally, it's happening. It's as if, like, I totally understand how millions of evolution require for, in some sense, this ape to advance and evolve. But when I look at, for example, in the insect kingdom, do you see? What I see is like literally a caterpillar turns it into a butterfly very quickly. It's as if the laws of change true. They are limited to the design. Sometimes you can say the mystic, the, the reason they, like in Buddhism perhaps, uh, it's not seen as a good thing to be incarnated in this world. It's because it's like, like pretty much being incarnated on earth in a deeply metaphysical Buddhist context is like, man, you came into the wrong world. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I hope my voice is loud enough. I'm... Yeah. So a caterpillar's transformation, it's like in the, while a caterpillar goes through metamorphosis in the cocoon, all the cells of the caterpillar die. And this, then when the last cell of the caterpillar is gone, it's like the last cell of, in some sense, uh, the first, the last cell of the caterpillar is the first cell, in some sense, of the butterfly.
honestly, it's kind of like if we are using 12% of our brain, if we had that 100%, the 12% would feel meaningless. What that means is whether we like it or not, there are deeper dimensions built into us. It is kind of evolution is doing something weird. It's like an eternal effort to continue. It's like evolution is the proof of eternity. Why the hell is this creature surviving? Why do the cells on this earth, when light was hit, imagine like uh, before like an, a creature evolved, it, were, it was just cells that light was hitting, night and day was occurring. Do you see? It's kind of incredibly fascinating. I cannot shout this loud enough. You know, it is so fascinating that we are on a rock that is constantly, it's like for some strange reason, it's orbiting and it's hitting the sun at various degrees. It's as if no moment is in the light all, all the time. You see? And that is fascinating to me. We are on a rock. Do you see what I'm saying? In the middle of nowhere, even before language was created, there was a sort of orbital structure. It's as if gravity remembers when the world was created. It was here before it. Do you see? The mystics have this philosophy that your mind at first is being governed by your ideology. Eventually, the ideology becomes this slowly, it fades like snow in the melting sun. <laughs> like melting snow in the sun, you know. Melting sun. <laughs> That self-actualization, the top of the pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it is not conceptual. Your fullest potential does not belong to an individual. It is just a great moment of the world. I want to tell you some stories of Diogenes. Diogenes was this Greek philosopher who was incredibly uh, in some sense, badass. Some know him as the father of cynicism, but many nowadays misunderstand the cynicism that Diogenes held. Diogenes had some stories that I know about this Greek philosopher. I have learned lo a lot from the ancient Greeks. You know, it's fascinating their contribution to just conceptual thought. <coughs> And I'm a Persian guy, so I'm just kidding. <laughs> of course, just like Diogenes says, this, the, here's, the, here's the first story of Diogenes. Somebody came and asked Diogenes, hey, Diogenes, where are you from, bro? And Diogenes looked at the man suddenly strange and intense, though, and said, where am I from? Like Robert De Niro, you, like, you talking to me, Diogenes? He said, me, I am from, uh, the citizen of the Cosmopolites. That was his response. That means this man, he saw himself as a citizen of manifestation of the cosmos. That's the level the ancients walked. You know, those are the clouds, the true clouds the ancients walked on. Hmm. And so Diogenes says that response in simple way. Yeah, he's being cynical. You know, in another way, holy shit, this dude is acknowledging a much more. It's as if he's seeing more out of the earth that is just orbiting in the middle. So there's that story of Diogenes. Another story is like Diogenes did something weird one day. He got a lantern in the day and ran in the streets with this lit lantern. And people were like, this oh, this man's crazy. He's wasting good, good candle wax, you know. <laughs> and so Diogenes is running in the market and he's looking for something. It's weird. It's as if he's looking for something everywhere. And people are, someone, somebody who knew Diogenes looks at him and says, Diogenes, 
What are you looking for, man? What are you doing? What are you looking for? And Darkening looks at him and says, I'm looking for an honest man. He was look he like with it with that one action he managed to reveal to his moment. He is looking for the authenticity of nature before any artificial construct, before any artificial spectrum. He said, "I'm looking for an honest man." That means I am looking for the truth of nature. And of course, the last story of the great Diogenes. <laughs> One day, Diogenes is just chilling on, on like this grassland. He's like leaned back, enjoying the sun. Literally, this dude is getting a tan, you know. <laughs> and so he suddenly sees, hears footsteps. Imagine you have closed your eyes. You're lying down on the grass on a sunny day. And you suddenly feel stomps on the ground. You suddenly open your, you suddenly notice some something blocked the sun. You open your eyes, and guess who do you see in the middle of you cl closing your eyes and getting a tan on the grassland? You see Alexander the Great. I'm not joking. Alexander the Great went to see Diogenes, and, I'm, and there's an artwork, incredible artwork that's related to this. Let me see if I can put it in here. Hold on. I'll find it in just a minute. This is uh, Just a second, guys. I'm trying to find the artwork for this. This is ridiculous. I can't find it. <laughs> There's something in the artwork where it shows like this man's tripping. Shame, guys. I, I don't know how I'm going to find it. 
Like I'm finding the serving on foot, but I'm not finding the meat. Okay, guys, pretty much, <clears throat> let me just finish this first. <sighs> Alexander the Great <clears throat> is suddenly there, and he looks at Diogenes, and he says, What does the great Diogenes want from the great Alexander, uh, from Alexander the Great? And what he means is, I'm emperor. The king has come to you, and what do you want if the king could get anything? That means he's showing respect. Alexander the Great is showing respect to him. is Alexander Diogenes looks at him and says stay out of my son don't block my son or something like that like don't block my light what he means is like I know you're emperor don't try to uh, uh, disturb my freedom you know something like that <coughs> and Alexander Great gets so touched by what he Diogenes says to him that it's as if his whole entourage is there and Diogenes back and the Alexander the Great looks like it looks at all his entourage and he's like what would the great oh uh, no sorry he says if, if I was not Alexander the Great I would be the great Diogenes and Diogenes looks at Alexander in front of his entourage and says you know he give, delivers the killer blow if this was a freestyle rap battle Diogenes wins you know, and Diogenes looks at him and says, if I was not Diogenes, I would be Diogenes. And it's as if, like, it's like a shocker. What he means by that is, even if I am not my, my thought, I am still me. You know, something is profound. It's that, you know, so that's the third story of the Armenian story. I still have not given up.
think I found it. There we go. So guys, if you look in the screen, you're going to wait. You're going to see oops. So that's kind of the moment where Alexander the Great goes and sees him, and his entourage is there. And um, of course, Diogenes was living like a homeless guy. <laughs> he was living in a barrel that he was in, but that's some next level thing. Probably not the best attempt for the uh, physiological needs of Maslow. <clears throat> human beings, their minds are absolute, a sort of level of personal intelligence as we become truly fulfill our social potential. That means that every person's mind, its greatest ability serves the species somehow. There requires to be uh, a sort of reception of, uh, how can I tell you, it's like right now your thoughts are orienting to your attention's evocational ability, 
but eventually they will come on their own and they can have certain speeds. I call these the speeds, it's like as thought moves, imagine thought as a satellite. And this satellite from the conscious to the mind is being sent into the unconscious. As it goes towards the unconscious, imagine it increases in speed. And so you can experience various speeds of thought. And thought doesn't come alone. It's like a line. It's like I had this teacher who <laughs> I did something very silly when I was in uh, <laughs> high school, you know. And uh, <laughs> pretty much uh, with with our advanced uh, functions teacher, uh, the mathematics teacher, this guy who was like, you know, the scientist, but because there were Muslim kids in the classroom, we would do, do a, a game of prayer in the evening. <laughs> like, I don't know why. But <laughs> Anyways, this man, he tells us this story that he got like a roll of pink string and he put the pink string in his jacket pocket and with a needle he kind of brought the string out and he went to gatherings and when there were young children the children started to pull the string <laughs> and the children would pull the string not understanding oh my god there's it's like LSD coming like it was like a magic trick kind of thing and uh anyways <laughs> He, he said it in a way where he said he was talking to this girl, but this teacher, of course, is a man in his 60s. <laughs> and I was so oblivious in that moment that I made this comment, and after, like, he said it, so there was a pause, and I'm like, did you get the number? <laughs> this is, guys, this is like seven years ago or something like that. This is a long time ago. Much longer than seven. And, uh, anyways, it was, it's like I was foolish, but the story was interesting. It's as if, like, there was a sort of, uh, how can I tell you, you pull the strings of reality on and eventually discover in a new way the machine is working. Your biological intelligence is, to be honest, something you have to study and document, you know. In some sense, how can I tell you, I've been driven into moments where I've seen my hand move faster than my thoughts. It's fascinating. The body can get to a certain rhythm that it's like, just like you don't think about your heartbeat because you're so certain of it. Your certainty with your moment of being reaches an ultimate point. When it reaches that point, what happens is that you just trust life. It's as if the inner child and who you are now have the same level of trust in the world and therefore all the segment realities and separations literally you get access to all the mind's content at once and then the moment you see that you notice what seeing it is beyond the content you know it's like you're you're zooming out uh, of a video game character that was never at the video game character it was the person playing what is playing the game is an attributeless empty uh, an attention that sees in like sight has an empty quality it's like existence is what is all the uh, gas in the balloon the, the gas in the balloon has no difference between out there and in there that means to some ex advanced extraterrestrials in the future if they come and see us they only see human beings as a sort of energetic existence. There's a story about this lion. Let's make him the Lion King from like the show Lion King from from the film. <laughs> and so the Lion King before Mufasa and the whole story of the Lion King starts before the film. Imagine that Lion King was walking more or like at the outskirts of his kingdom. And he's walking in the forest and he comes to something unbelievable. He comes to this kind of, kind of fence and in the fence he sees a group of sheep and lamb and everything like 
there, and then in the middle of it, there's a lion, a full-grown ass lion, who's in the middle of the sheep, just standing there like a sheep. And the lion is like fasting from you to fast. <laughs> and so the lion is standing there. This lion king looks at him. It's like, what the It's like a lion in my kingdom is behaving like this. And in some sense, he goes there and he shouts and he shouts and he says, Lion, you know, and he says sheep. And instantly in that moment, it's like all the sheep run away, you know. And in some sense, it's kind of like that moment where that king, that lion has stood there as if that lion among the sheep, even though it believed itself to be a sheep, had a courage the other sheep didn't. And all the other sheep went. And so this lion was, uh, the lion that thinks it's a sheep is there. And the lion king's like, yo, yo sheep, come. I want to show you something. I'm the king of the jungle, listen to me. And so the, uh, she, uh, the sheep, the lion that thinks it's a sheep goes. And the lion king takes him to a pond. He takes him to a pond. Lion King commands to the sheep, the lion that thinks it's a sheep, to stare in the pond. He says, look at yourself, what do you see? That lion that thinks it's a sheep looks in the pond and looks at itself, same old reflection, and says, I see a sheep. And then the Lion King says, look at my reflection. And the lion that thinks it's a sheep for the first time looks at the lion's re Lion King's reflection and looks at himself and realizes he's royal. some sense he realizes he has the face of a king <clears throat> now what that means is the sheep for, for the let's just look in the mind of that lion that thought it's a sheep the metaphor of the sheep is normality defined by others the definition of the lion is a self-aware Self-awareness is a, is, a, is a pillar of civilization that must be protected. I've written these series of books, um, John Piper, which are called The Pillars of Civilization. And in each one of them, I've given this kind of like one of those Mr. Things kind of puzzles for the world. You know?
awakening from the past that no longer exists and the future which hasn't come into existence. We are left in the present moment. Now this present moment, we have found the audacity to acknowledge its hollowness. It's as if strangely your mind must learn from emptiness. That place don't feel anything, feel is a waste, is a waste of an interpretation, a moment's interpretation. And so in some sense, uh, for me, it's like any any phenomena that appears in my, my, my moment. It can have a multidimensional context. It can have a singular dimensional context. Now, regardless of what happens, the psychology has comprehended its changing nature. Therefore, it's as if, without our conscious attention, it's as if our biological body is changing. You don't have the same body you had as 10 years ago. So similarly, the, our thought of ourself is the same, the will of it's the same, me going to the Supreme Good for me, take, you know? And so it's like, <laughs> of course, it's been some time where I don't celebrate birthdays for that reason. What I'm trying to say, Is that there are many programs happening at once. Literally, the mind has many applications open, just like your smartphone. So what I'm trying to say is, you look at these applications and you see certain emotions throughout the day are arising from nothing to do with the present moment, but with what the present moment reflects as your past. The mind exists in accordance to stimulus. That stim stimulus is a present evocation because it's present. E it's a present evocation. It means regardless of how much you conceptualize the future and the past, they're just momentary generations. So you free your mind's filter of a sort of linear hierarchical and spectrum oriented validity. You don't deny it. You don't pull away. The it's like the ego is just a technology, it's a vehicle, you know? It's as if they ask this enlightened yogi and they're like, what is God? And the enlightened yogi was like, your ego is the God. And the guy's like, my ego is God? Isn't the ego the source of the problems? Isn't the ego like Alexander the Great blocking the sun? And the wise man would say no. Anything that affects you tends to have structure. You study the structure of your moment, you begin to see beyond it. it eventually, after you live for yourself for some time, when I say live for yourself, I mean it, it, it doesn't matter where you exist, how you exist. It's literally you're aware of life happening. And your mind is kind of tunneling through various experiences into who you are in this moment. The lion sees what the lamb does not. The free see what the, free, uh, the enslaved do not. The truth sees what the illusion does not. And it's a very bold claim I'm making. Sometimes when I hear my own talks, I'm like, did I, did I just say that? <laughs> but I'm telling you, like, 
there will come an apocalypse to linguistic knowledge. I have created the term the language threshold. I have spoken about the linguistic simulation. I have divided the moment into explanations of the subjective and the objective. I have in some sense shown that regardless of whatever ideological method and uh, utilize, eventually you will trust the rhythms of the unknown. The rhythms of the unknown are in some sense like the, the world speaking and you hearing it directly from your experiential encounters. That means it's like after you've heard enough external words, you're going to scare it, suddenly wonder about your own mind. You know, I tell people, I tell like the natural thing with these talks of mine is that I hope the audience takes this into consideration. Listen to, if I do a good job, one talk will be enough. If I fail in the talk, you, you, you're going to be listening to a lot of it. Because my whole notion is that I am kind of trying to say that language is a mirror of your own intelligence. Even though I say these words, your mind is bringing them to life to influence the what's real to you. So eventually, you re, you, what the, the best thing is to realize it, it, external truth is a reflection of how the inner being is occurring, your inner structure is positioned. So eventually, you will realize, oh my god, I thought I got to go read stuff outside. No, that's only a phase. And then you learn from what is within you. Literally, you learn from various states of mind by paying attention to how the is being present. And then the wings of revolution will begin. Then it doesn't matter what the mind sees or the landscape. Suddenly it's as if there would come a wave of intelligence, a sort of renaissance movement in the mind of the future generations, that they're like the sooner we help everybody a sort of peaceful level where their true, their mind's genius can step out. It's like that's, that's when the civilization is advanced. When it has the advanced potential uh, possible. Right now, society is like this kind of machine that people are coming to live in, and they come and live inside this machine, and rather than the machine adjusting to the people, the people have to adjust to the machine. Therefore, they have to filter their intelligence to only what is valuable external. That means so social creatures, even though we are in society, nobody is really themselves in, in a public setting. Because their sense of self is divided by the minds of others. And because it's divided by the minds of others, they begin paying attention to everything. And therefore, language suddenly has an incredible restriction in social situations. You see, it depends on like whose mind is in the person's imagination, to be honest, is your, is your playful, creative impulse. It is something innate. It's, it's like an energetic expression you can have feelings, but not everybody has feelings. Because they are content with an inefficient world. They don't care. They, it's like they're, they're computers and they're, in some sense, technology is updating, but we are forgetting to update our ideas of belief. For me, beliefs are like leaves on a tree. They change every season. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, what I mean mentionably by this is I hope that you care for your intelligence and you wonder about it and realize only you can, to be honest, explore who you are. And who you are is a relationship of you with thought and you with matter. That means a sense of you arises from matter and a sense of you is also present, which has a conceptual thought-oriented memory uh, kind of mini round uh, uh, um, view. You 
you, you will find something kind of like how in writers, um, writers would say when you write 10,000 sentences, then you become able to write any sentence. So you develop your own style eventually because you've, you're feeding something so much that it, even if you choose to not put your full effort, which is what the word fake means, right? And so if you choose not to do that, eventually you'll get so bored of uh, an unauthentic pattern or program that you'd suddenly navigate to the authentic program. This is why you can't do a thing for a long time. Rumi, this poet, said, if you make your hand into a fist, the muscle kind of eventually hits some sort of paralysis. But if you, even if you stretch your hand wide open, you see it's as if like suddenly the a muscle would reach a paralysis. So it's not about too much of an extreme energetic effort. It's a, it's, it's a balance of an abidance with phenomena as attention navigates through it until its next conscious checkpoint. Because you have to sleep. To be honest, I think I have a lot to say about sleep, <laughs> but that's for another talk, you know. <sighs> Thanks for tuning in. It's much blessings and love. Presence sees what the person asks.